Thank you so much, everyone, for your uh, energy over the last few days. I'm really excited to uh, introduce our final panel for this year's N3 conference. Uh, this is called Lessons Learned from MH370. And I'd like to introduce our moderator, AAJ member Alan Chung, who is an Asia Pacific Bureau Chief uh, for Institutional Investor. He's uh, flown down from Beijing and has been a longtime member of the Asian American Journalists Association. He's going to introduce our distinguished panelists. Alan, thank you. Thank you for that, Ramey. Uh, this panel, I guess, is something that all of us, none of us, probably missed out on. Uh, it's, it's a story that has uh, kind of uh, mystified uh, the entire world. And mystery continues to surround the fate of Malaysia Airlines flight MH370, which disappeared en route from KL to Beijing uh, a couple of months ago, March 8th. And no signs of wreckage has been found, and to this day, none of the investigators across more than half a dozen, actually over a dozen nations who helped in the search effort, have found any solid evidence just exactly where the plane went down or exactly what happened to it. It's almost as if the airplane vanished into the twilight zone. With us today are three distinguished journalists, senior journalists who uh, have years of experience, who either personally covered the tragedy or oversaw teams of journalists who covered the tragedy from the front lines. Uh, to my immediate left is Ted Anthony, Asia Pacific News Director of Associated Press, uh, who is based in Bangkok. He oversees more than 100 journalists uh, across the region. He was appointed to the post only on March 4th, and within his first week on the job, he was overseeing the breaking news of missing MH370. And next to him, we have Adam Nodgeberg, who's the digital editor for, a uh, for Asia at the Wall Street Journal. He oversaw the crisis and managed a team of journalists who presented the news in both video, print, and in various forms of multimedia. And next to him is uh, Ms. Huan Yuan, who is a senior reporter uh, at Tencent Group, which is one of China's leading internet and digital content providers. Uh, Wan uh, was part of a team of journalists from China who covered the event from the front lines and uh, from throughout Southeast Asia, particularly in Malaysia and also in Beijing, where uh, many of the survivors of the Chinese passengers waited for weeks and literally months anxiously for news about the fate of their relatives, which to this day they do not know what happened. So uh, rather than each starting off to going on uh, what they did, I'm going to ask this question. Is Ted, can you start us off with and, and tell us what, when did you get assigned this story and how big of a deal did you initially think this was going to be and did you expect it in quickly and are you surprised? It still hasn't been. That's a lot of questions to start with. <laughs> <coughs> well, it was, um, if I recall correctly, it was a Friday night in the United States, and I had, as, as um, was said, I had just uh, been appointed to this job and wasn't even really in it yet. Uh, and I remember in the initial hours being on uh, multiple media with our folks all over this region and uh, our, our desk in Bangkok and thinking that, you know, this is a short-term thing. I mean. I've covered and, and overseen coverage of plane crashes before, and they don't turn out like this, which is uh, pretty obvious, but we, we expected it to be, at the most, you know, a few hour thing, and then it would kick into what stories like this typically do, which is finding out why the plane did what it did, dealing with the aftermath in terms of whether there were any survivors, in terms of the victims, in terms of uh, figuring out uh, uh, who was to blame, if anyone, how this could have prevented, whether it was mechanical or, or pilot related or other reasons. So our first hours were basically, they were dedicated to setting up what we thought would be a plane crash story, which of course it turned out not to be. And I think that, uh, uh, I think that we realized that something was strange about this when, uh, when the rumors started flying, when we, uh, we saw the, the, the tweet and retweets about uh, that it had landed in Nanning and then it hadn't and uh, uh, all of these strange things started to come in and fill the vacuum. And I think uh, probably about five or six hours in we started to realize that this was something unusual but even on that first night I don't think that anybody dreamed that we'd be sitting here uh, effectively three months later and still wondering what happened to this plane. Adam? Yeah, pretty much what, what he said um, but you know on a smaller scale. No. Um, We've had no fewer than five bureaus around this region dealing with this story pretty much every day for 
three months. Um, we also have had reporters in Washington who look at aerospace and defense. Um, we, you know, talking to the guys who look at, at data from satellites. We've had people who cover the satellite industry out of Los Angeles. And, you know, from, from a digital standpoint, um, Ted asked this when we were talking outside, you know, how do you cover this visually when you're searching for something on the ocean? You know, for us, it's very easy for the first probably month to come up with all the things that you want to show, all the big data that you want to collect. You get bios of everyone on the plane and you, you recreate the seating chart and you put the bios down there and you do it in all the different languages of the different editions. And then after you spend a month coming up with these great ideas, you do these great explainer videos um, with lots of graphics on the screen. And now three months later we're going, uh, 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 it's still a story, there's still a lot of resources being thrown at it, but this is a first for us digitally as well and visually as well because you just cannot constantly stay on top of this. Juan, can you tell us from your point of view, how did you get the story and did you expect it to last so long? Uh, of course, uh, before I answer uh, Adam's question, um, I'll answer questions. I like to uh, clarify a little. In case any of you have a question, um, I'm a reporter from Tencent. As some of you may know, Tencent is the largest uh, internet company in China. But uh, you probably don't know uh, where's the reporter, the media related with it. So here's the same uh, Tencent. Besides uh, the other business, it has another division. It's uh, uh, the as a media. And uh, we got the QQ.com and WeChat and the app on mobile as this uh, platform for its content. So that's uh, how it's here is a reporter from Tencent. And uh, answer uh, audience questions. I think that's, uh, yeah, on the weekend, um, before ev everybody, anybody knowing anything, so there is the airplane missed. And uh, the next minute, we are uh, back in our package and uh, on the way to the Malaysia and uh, on my trip to the airport on the t in the taxi. Uh, specifically, I was uh, thinking about uh, uh, the article I was reading about the, uh, on the uh, New York Times years ago, a feature story about the uh, Air France and that the last time that's accident. And it's uh, all about uh, how the uh, wreckage of the airplane was uh, discovered and uh, the journalist on site. And uh, there is a detail like uh, there is a shoes discovered on the sea. When people pick it up, there was a broken neck in it. That kind of a detail, it's even horrible to speak of it. But uh, at that time, that what I was prepared to think if I go on the front line, front line what I will confront with. So I don't know, it could be a very serious trauma there. Um, but anyway, that, as a journalist, that's your job. You get on the front line, as close to the side as possible. And then the later stories, everybody knows. It comes out, uh, nobody could, could predict. Yeah. So, uh, and Ted, can you tell us a little bit, what was the single most Difficult aspect of covering this breaking news story, which is on and on and on. Uh, what, what was the most difficult aspect Ed, of covering this story, which just dragged on and on and on? I think <clears throat> making there. I'll, I'll answer that. There's two ways that I think uh, it, it was difficult. I think it was difficult because even though there were a lot of places involved, it was in one fundamental way a placeless story. I mean, it's certainly Kuala Lumpur was an important place in it. Beijing was an important place in it, and there were other places, but the story itself, the very core and nub of it, lacked a place. We didn't, you know, you, you couldn't converge anywhere and say, this is the story. And so we, uh, we had to deal with a very, very fragmented story that, uh, that uh, involved Malaysia, that involved uh, China, that involved Australia, that involved uh, American sources, that involved a company in London, and pulling together and making some coherence out of all of that different information and making sure that we had it and had it right in all these different places involved a, a huge amount of coordination. And I think that, that was one of the things that made it difficult. Uh, and I, I, I think the other thing that, that made it difficult was the huge, and this also made it uh, a, a rewarding story, the huge appetite of the world for information on this. Um, people were paying attention to this. They were paying attention to it 
at levels beyond what we expected our metrics showed, at levels uh, that, in terms of duration, it kept going on and on and on, you know, even on days where there wasn't uh, major transcendent news, that people were hungry for this. And that um, led us to have to make sure that we were, um, I, I, I don't like to use the term feeding the beast, because I think that that brings up uh, sort of, it suggests irresponsibility that we're just coming up with things that aren't news. But we had to find angles and be very assertive about finding things that would be responsible, that would be accurate, but would also uh, answer the interest that our customers and, and their readers and users and, and watchers were having. So those are, those are the two things that I would say were the most uh, challenging of this. Adam, what was the single most difficult aspect for you and your team? Uh, the, the sheer noise. There was just so much stuff coming from so many different places. You know, there's, on one hand, you love social media when you're able to transport your stories around the world, around the web. But it's another thing when every blogger, every tweeter, every person on their Facebook post is posting everything they possibly can, unconfirmed, nonsensical. Um, what you end up doing is uh, spending a lot of your time playing defense and trying to backstop and, and, and back report and see if something is true, confirming it. You know, to a large degree, that's where we would say, like, well, if it's not on the AP in some cases, and we're not, we don't have anyone in that area, we're not picking it up. Uh, we also, I see one of my colleagues from Storyful in the audience. Storyful is a company that does a really great job um, uh, confirming and uh, social media uh, what you see, especially video. So, if you should tell your organizations, by the way, to to look at Storyful. They make your job, they make my job a lot easier, especially during this. Sorry, that's not a plug for Storyful. I'm just, it's a fact that there's just so much stuff that you have to try and, and verify and confirm. You cannot do it on your own. Okay, and Juan, you were out in the field, I, I understand, in yes. Malaysia. What was the single most difficult aspect in covering the story for you? You are blind and deaf at the initial stage. You know nothing. You have no any resources established there. Can you get your story? Where do you find it? You can choose. You just uh, stay at the news conference, get uh, all the other people they get. Or you really want to get know what's really going on and get the core news. But uh, I think it's not a, it's quite a typical, typical difficulties as the China press are confronted there. It's um, seldom not as a Western Journal, not as AP, you have the years of the experience of uh, covering these international breaking news. But for China media, most of the time, it's just for the uh, like Olympics, like World Cup, these uh, sports things. So it's just like this thing, okay, never happened. And this time, so, so many Chinese media, probably because the uh, Chinese family members, there are all different uh, princes, pro province in China involved. So even the very far away prom, uh, province sent their local media to join this covering of this sports there. While so many Chinese reporters are there. And uh, back home, Chinese people are asking, are even very uh, criticizing. What kind of news you've got for us? Or you're just a copy. The other people, the other like the BBC, like the CNN, and uh, like the other international, the big brands, what they are talking. So you just uh, copy it to us. Everyday Chinese reporters on the side, they can face that uh, pressure. Speaking of that pressure, one of the most difficult parts of covering the story is the China angle. The families, the Chinese families, were very emotional and at times very, very angry and they even attacked the journalists involved, uh, venting their anger, and they marched on the Malaysian embassy, they threw stones at the Malaysian embassy. At times they kidnapped the Malaysian airline staff. Uh, were, were you and your crew from your organizations uh, ever attacked, and how did you handle this emotion that was out there? I don't have, because I wasn't on the ground, I don't know if there was any, uh, any tension between our crews and and uh, the, the passengers' families. Uh, I would have heard if there was anything large. Um, but what I can tell you is that we have conversations all the time in the AP. And we had a conversation around this story about how to approach families, about how to, you know, how to balance the need to get answers to questions with the need to respect 
their space and understand that they're going through the most traumatic event of, our, of their lives while our folks are simply at a day at work. So I, I think that built in, baked into the AP's DNA for news gathering is conversations about that so that we don't go over the line with that kind of thing. That, that being said, um, I do know that there were times, there were critical junctures where the AP and other news organizations were also able to give a voice to the families when they wanted to say something, when they wanted to, to amplify what they had to say and what they were feeling. So I do think there was that side of it as well. All right. Adam? We were never in any kind of physical danger. I think, you know, there were a couple of tension points where uh, family members shared something and then regretted sharing and you want to be sensitive to them, but at the same time, you want to be complete with your story and accurate and fair with your story. So, you know, no one ever threatened us or beat us up, but, you know, there was uh, there a fair bit of tension at a few points with some of the family members for the reasons that Ted mentioned. I mean, this is a horrible experience for them. Absolutely. So, Juan, can you tell me from Tencent, your coverage, and other Chinese journalists out there covering this, there was a lot of raw emotions. Yes, of course. Um, my colleagues has a better position to say this uh, than me because uh, uh, we have a colleague uh, uh, separated in Beijing and in Malaysia to specially uh, cover the family members. And uh, in this whole issue, the most important thing towards the family members you, while, while you're covering it, it is uh, to respect them. As a journalist, of course, it's a career demand that you need to report this. But the most important, we all are human beings. We are not here to consume you. We are not here to make use of you. We are here to try to understand you and try to uh, transcend your voices if you want. If you want this kind of thing, you're not It's very unhuman, and uh, so we understand how the family members they could get very emotional, and um, so there is uh, the limes, the limits. You should watch out. I think that's a great thought. We're not here to consume you. I think that we, as journalists, are in danger of you know starting to look at the people we interview as pieces of a product, and we can never do that. Especially in this type of a situation where so much hurt and people have no idea what happened to the family, right? Yeah. So, so which leads us to the other question is there were a lot of complaints about authorities involved in the release of information and how much was released when and by which authority. So I, I, I guess from the three of you, and we'll, we'll go to media to Ted, which authorities did you find the most cooperative and the least cooperative during your coverage cycle? I think there was certainly some lack of cooperation. I think some of that in the early stages was very a very human reaction. Um, the notion that you are you don't know what's going on and you hold your information close to your chest. That's something we've all experienced as journalists. Um, I think that the, the most difficult thing with authorities ended up being that uh, uh, often there was there didn't seem to be a lot of coordination even after they established some of the the mechanisms to coordinate. And so there was conflicting information coming out from authorities who had sometimes position themselves as working together. And so that, to me, was, uh, w was the thing that, that, that bedeviled us, I think, the most. It, uh, it, it made us have to um, double verify, even from, from people and sources we had to some extent learned to trust. And I guess the other authority I would say, and this is a bit of a, um, I'm kind of changing the terms of your question, but I feel like the, the implied authority, as Adam said, of the, the chatter out there and the things that were, were being released, quote unquote, and I use released as they were, they would, uh, they would pop up. It was a, a, a little bit, little eruptions here and there that purported to come from voices of authority, but actually weren't. And so, uh, we had to ferret those out, and that very much, uh, that was one of the the major problems we dealt with. Adam. So one of the things that struck me, I have two thoughts on this. One is that, um, because this involved just to a large degree questions uh, about uh, satellite imagery. Um, you know, we, we came up with some of the Immersat stuff that belied some of what they were saying about, the different countries were saying about the radar, is nobody wanted to show, no country wanted to really show you their, their radar capabilities or their, their satellite capabilities. So you end up wondering whether it's ineptitude or secrecy, and ultimately it doesn't matter because you're not getting 
the double confirmation that you were talking about. And the, the second thought I have about this is that, you know, it, in some ways this has been remarkable for Malaysia. I, I, you know, to answer you very specifically, I think it was very hard to deal with the Malaysian government on this one. It's a lot better than it was in the Mahathir years. I, I think that, you know, back then the default answer was blame it on Anwar or blame it on the Jews. And, and you know, not to be politically incorrect about this, but uh, after I just was in politically incorrect about it, um, <laughs> But, but I think that, you know, the Malaysian government has sort of a tin ear, and this is a largely government-owned airline. So, you know, when you send um, customer service women in hijab to Beijing, where, you know, people are distraught, they're upset, but they're also worried about uh, Muslim separatists in Xinjiang, you know, it's just, it's a kind of a tin ear sort of thing. And I, I think that trying to get accurate, timely information from the Malaysian government was hard because they were operating on their own time frame and on the, with their own agenda, not necessarily our news cycle. How about you, Juan? You were out on the field dealing with the Malaysians. Did you find them difficult? How do they compare with, say, the Chinese? Let's see it in this way. When it comes to authority, neither of them, none of them will be cooperate. Neither side. That's how they get called authority. <laughs> So, and in this case, uh, it might come surprise, but actually you all can understand that um, it's especially when you deal with uh, your own people, it will be even difficult. So the Malaysian government, of course, they were not willing to cooperate. Why they should be? But um, in the Chinese side, it could be even more difficult. I have a story to share, it's like, um, it's my personal experience there. Uh, probably the last day I stay at um, uh, KL. Um, that day was the uh, Hussein Mutin. He is the first time to meet the family members come from uh, China. And uh, it's uh, very internal meetings. All the media is in the hotel. All the media was in the lobby no entrance to the uh, room into the meeting. I was the only journalist got invited by the uh, Mars. Oh, here is a tip, by the way. Yesterday, uh, that gentleman uh, uh, telling us about how to do your uh, resumes to let people get an impression of you. As I say, why I got the, I got to be the only journalist to be invited in that room it is because I keep contact with the Mars spokesman. And, and it's a, in that last week, I think it's every day or every two days I get a call. Of course, I called for, can you give me this exclusive interview with your CEO? Keep doing that. Of course, not, not making you feel bothered, but uh, anyway. You sway around uh, at her background, and when there is a sense come up, you are the first person probably could think. Uh, other side, of course, Tencent with the, your uh, distribution channels in China, that's impactive, also a consideration, but uh, I think make people remember you. That's how you establish these things. That's one tip. And then um, I got into there, and uh, the family members and uh, the Kizan uh, Mutin, they are just sitting around very close, and I have a nice picture of it. And he brought his wife and son together in that room. And they talk, and he's uh, uh, have a paper on his knees and drawing the, pic, uh, drawing the lines and uh, explain to the family members how this thing is going on like that. I only allowed to be there for 10 minutes. Then I was asked out. And um, this thing was uh, discovered by uh, Chi Chinese ambassador side, uh, the working staff there from the China side, and they got uh, very angry about that. I said, why, there is a journalist in this room. And um, suddenly, I was at the entrance of that door after, after the meeting was over, and uh, there are uh, seven or six people suddenly come up and uh, surrounded me, and uh, in the angry mood, I say. Who are you? Why are you here? Who took you here? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the people are say, oh, grab his, uh, smart, uh, grab his phone. Her phone, it uh, must be taking pictures or the videos or audios. Uh, we need to delete it or whatsoever. And uh, it's just like uh, there are tigers around you. And you don't know what they're going to do next. 
In that uh, kind of situation, I choose to be the liar against the tiger. And say, oh, you have no right. This is my personal stuff. What's right give you? Do you want to take it? And uh, I was here invi by invited. But I'm not saying uh, how kinds of invited, because uh, I don't know. I want to protect, I pr protect Mars, because I don't know what's going on there. Um, and at th that time, just to say, OK, they know I'm a Chinese reporter. And, and these are who trying to take away your personal property? It's uh, surrounded and led by the Chinese uh, ambas uh, embassies uh, working so staff. So these are Chinese officials? I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, led by the Chinese officials. Okay. And uh, after that, I just, uh, and uh, there comes to a critical moment. Some people, I, I, I don't know, but maybe it's a careless, but touching you. And uh, it's, uh, I don't know, I just feel my head being touched a little. Okay, I think I, I just react very fiercely. What are you doing? It's kind of uh, when people say you are very strong and tough, okay, they will get to soften a little. And then they're going to argue and say, you cannot push this. This is very uh, no media in invited or anything like that. Uh, I, I didn't want to quit him. And uh, only for the Mars people, they asked me, probably not to impact this uh, country's relationship. So, so choosing the family story is not coming out. But I just say, when you are dealing with uh, each side, your family side could be the most uh, tough one to uh, deal with. Which leads us to our next question is, uh, for each of the panelists. Which authority do you think try to control the news? You know, I don't, I don't feel overly qualified to answer that one, but I do, I will say that I, I do feel like um, the overall feeling was that everybody was trying to control. Um, and I, I don't think there are exceptions to that, because when you don't know what's going on, like I said earlier, you just want to clamp down. And that's not always a, a good reaction when dealing with the media or dealing with the public, but it's a, I suppose it's an understandable one. Yeah, I, kind of what, what Ted said, it, it's, it's more um, along the lines of there's a sense in 2014, even in Malaysia, which is still fairly closed, um, in, in media relations and public relations that you have to control the message. And, and I feel like what differed from place to place, it was more like the Malaysians would hold on to things and sometimes it would come out only because someone had leaked it. Or, you know, and, and then you were left with the question, were they trying to verify it or were they trying to bury it? As opposed to the Australians who were extremely happy to say everything, even if it was completely wrong. Um, you know, it's, it's the opposite side of it. So. I, I just feel like it, you know, it was more about controlling the message and the spin than it was trying to hide something or stop something from coming out. Okay, Juan, in, in your experience in Malaysia, did you find the Malaysians were more helpful than the Chinese, or how, who, how, what was your experience? My experience is the Malaysian people are terrifically good, terrifically helpful. And uh, that's uh, how I got my big story, my, why Tencent got that uh, uh, Malaysia's uh, uh, military radar data of uh, how this uh, flight uh, was dismissed. Because uh, Malaysia's uh, uh, military radar have its tracking all the way. They have its tracking. So since uh, day one, they should know the airplane is not in the South China Ocean. The first week in the mainland, it's, um, it's by the Vietnam and the Malaysia in the uh, eastern part, it's totally a waste. It shouldn't have happened. The first day they should know it's in the uh, Malacca Strait. So, and uh, why, how the Malaysian people help me? If uh, there is no help by the Malaysian people, this could never happen. As we say, Chinese uh, journalists uh, there are deaf and blind in the flat, uh, initial stage. You are, but that's why you got to establish all your coherence and eyesight as quickly as possible. By how? Make friends. From who? Other journalists. The international ones, the local ones, the local ones are especially important. They got all the news quicker than any others. And if you are, they are your friends, you get quicker than your peers. And the other, I think the, the first week, I went to uh, Costa Baru. Most people you never heard about the place, but that is where the uh, 
initial stage the research, uh, research center was based. It's a very remote province uh, of the Malaysia, and um, most media probably don't know there is a, whether there was uh, any news conference there. But uh, as a uh, Tencent, we just heard that uh, there is a center there. Uh, probably they're going to find this uh, plane, so just go there. And uh, in the whole week there, the transport uh, is, uh, there are no logistics. If you don't have your own car, it's very difficult. But I never, in that whole week, I never spent a penny on the transport. All helped by the Malaysia people. Free taxi. I don't know why. They're just not kind. OK, that's good. So obviously, different experiences. You had good experience with the Malaysians. OK, that's good. So now, now of course, all this process of all this reporting has been three months. All this process, all this reporting, it's been three months. Thank you for reminding me. The story of MH370 isn't complete and may not be complete for perhaps years or ever. So I guess in your opinion, Ted, can you tell us what is the real news significance of MH370? Why should we journalists even want to continue following this story? I think, I think that's a good question um, because as we were talking about earlier, the, we are the, the media consuming uh, civilization of Earth, if you put it, are really, really accustomed to distinct endings to our stories. We have been raised on movies and on, on narratives that have an ending. And we get really uncomfortable and we don't know what to do with ourselves when things don't end in some kind of coherent way. Even a bad ending is at least an ending. And so what we have here is no ending at all. And that, I think that, that eats at people. So to me, one, one reason of continuing to cover this is to, to show people that life isn't tidy and that things don't have distinct endings and that there are lives that continue to be affected by this. And there are people who continue to go through pain because of this. And just because it's not a big search or a large jam-packed news conference or a, a prime minister making a, a, a statement that the whole world is watching, that there are still ripples that are going out from this and that not, not all news ends in a very distinct fashion. And the, the other reason is going back to those people who are affected. I mean, we can put this in a nice little box as, you know, a mystery that is, you know, we can throw out, uh, we can throw out references to how it's like a movie. And I heard so many of those. And, and we, we tend to look at life as, as if it's like a movie. But in fact, there's all this quiet pain going on in a lot of different places. And there's a lot of work going on in a lot of different places to try to figure out what happens here. And there's a lot of money being spent. And those are the reasons to keep covering it. Adam? Yeah, no, very simply, uh, I've been a journalist for nearly 25 years. And the reason why this is the best and most interesting job ever uh, is because just when you think you've seen it all, you haven't seen it all. You tend to, in whatever job you do, put things into little boxes and say, oh, it's like this or it's like that. And after a while, you're like, ah, I've seen it all. But for something like this, what it's teaching me is that the news cycle is, you know, it can extend almost indefinitely. And you still have to cover it. And you still have to stay sharp. And you still have to move things along. Yeah, it's teaching us to organize ourselves differently. It's teaching us to work together across bureaus differently, across platforms differently. And, and I'm just finding that because it's stretching out for such a long period of time, um, reporters on three different continents are getting more comfortable with each other. Um, and we're also getting more comfortable with the fact that we, we can turn around a, a, an incremental development a lot more quickly than we could at the beginning when this comes to a resolution, and it probably will. They'll, they'll probably locate the plane at some point. Um, we will be ready and we will have the full package so when you step back 10 years from now, as, as we've been doing with the Air France flight, you'll be able to see the entire body of work and that there are no big holes in it anywhere. Juan. From Tencent's point of view, would you continue to cover this? Oh, I cannot speak for Tencent for you, only my personal view. Let's face it, news report is about new stuff. So when this incident again not so new, no new progress, media will drop their attention to it. That's the truth. But let's back, come back to the basics. Why journalism should be there? There are injustice, there are justice lost in this incident. 
something happened there. People don't know that caused to this incident. And there are still lives they are missed. We don't know for how many years. But uh, as for the neck of justice, as the answer for people's lives, this should be continued. Maybe not by very, very obvious uh, focus, but at least me. I think many of people, many of the reporters will keep tracking it if we have the chance and the will keep it in our mind. Before we open up to the general audience, I have one other question. Is, I guess two questions. Is, um, what do you think, personally, having covered it for three months, our teams of hundreds of people under you covering it, really happened to MH370? And finally, after that, is what are the lessons learned for all of us journalists who covered this event? I don't think you'll be surprised that I wouldn't begin to speculate. <laughs> um, <laughs> but nice try. <laughs> <clears throat> um, in terms of, you know, the lessons learned, I think I have five lessons that we take from this. And they are verify, 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 and verify. Also verify. <laughs> um, we learned from the very first hours to a month into this that what we don't say is just as important as what we do say. And I think that's a, a really good lesson to take away from this. We, um, there's a lot of talk with the democratization and fragmentation of media about the media's role or, or lack thereof these days as gatekeeper. And I, I agree with and see merit in a lot of the arguments, but I also very much believe, and as someone who is a big believer in crowdsourcing and in citizen journalism and in the power of social media, I also believe that the media, at least the, the mainstream media, has a role to play and ferreting out what really happened and using our resources and our access and our ability to be on the ground in specific places to say, no, this plane didn't land safely here. No, this guy on this oil rig didn't see a fireball in the sky because we traced his email address and it didn't go anywhere and it, 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 nothing ever came of it. We can ha use our resources to debunk and to say, this didn't happen, or this really did happen. And so that verification, I think, is still a fundamental underpinning of everything that we do. Um, Adam, you, so you're optimistic they're going to eventually find this plane, right? And so can you tell us why? And, and also, what do you think are the lessons for us? Yeah, I'm going to have to go with Ted on, on the, you know, I don't know what happened to the plane. And, and part of our ongoing coverage of this is going to be to try to bring it to some kind of resolution when, when that happens. Um, it, I think the biggest lesson from this one is that all of the conceptions of how you cover a story ch have, have changed from this. Um, the fundamentals are still the same, but we, I've never seen anything where we've had so many bureaus, so many different people over such a long period of time where it wasn't something like a war. Um, you know, it, it's taught me also uh, to have a better filter and that sometimes trust other people's filters like the Associated Press's filter, like Storeful's filter. Um, it, it's a very uncomfortable feeling to know that even though you're a successful, you know, well-resourced newspaper, that you still can't cover a story 24-7, 365 by yourself. Yeah, no, I of course agree with was said and of course I will not say any speculations here no matter what I've heard in the all the kinds of interviews all the rumors around the internet I think you every one of you must have heard of one of two and uh, okay the rumors are horrible and uh, I for my interview I even got more horrible information than that but I'm not going to speak here for a journalist remember be objective so rumors oh no way Privately, that's another thing. And for the lessons, uh, I just mentioned how the Chinese media are facing these kinds of pressures there. Uh, but here I want to say, it, um, we could take a look uh, not only as the Chinese media, it could take a look as uh, when the media or when you yourself as a reporter, you are like lacking the experience you are lacking the resources. You have nothing. Then, when the things come out, how will you do? 
what are you going to choose? Everybody use your imaginary when this incident happened on the first day. Okay, you have the options. Where are you going to send people to Vietnam? When you, where are you going to send people to Malaysia? And will you even send people to Coast Babaru, a very far away place of Malaysia? How will you choose? Where do you think you got the big story? That's a choice, and it requires a good judgment. Of course, I'm lucky. And uh, then, um, for Tencent to, to get this uh, uh, military radar trackings, this kinds of news, uh, in China it's like, um, you know, uh, in America, Huffington Post won Pulitzer. In China, Tencent got the news, got that very exclusive information from uh, Malaysia military. It's kinds of news like that. While the other long time established media, they couldn't achieve. Why? Here is the same. When everybody is on the line of knowing nothing, we can always come back to the basics of journalism. Come back to your passion, to your persistence, and good judgment. For instance, um, I was uh, in Costa Baru there. Um, in the first few days, I think that one of the most uh, exciting adventure, even we can call it so, here is the day when the Chinese satellite get uh, this satellite Im in, uh, image and say probably the MH370 is in that area. And in that very morning, the uh, MMEA, like the Coast, uh, Coast Guard of America, uh, they're going to send ships to that area and uh, they're going to bring some media reporters with them. And of course, the local ones. And I was there and I got new this information from my local media friend. And uh, of course, I went there and uh, I asked you, argued with uh, the uh, commander of the MMEA. Uh, and uh, I said, yeah, and because uh, the last day, uh, I happened to meet uh, the uh, commander, the general of the MME of Malaysia, and uh, we had a talk, and uh, by that I have asked him, oh, if there is chances coming out, uh, can, you, can, can you allow me to get on the ship? He said politely, of course we can, like that. So the next day, <laughs> these chances come up, and uh, for me, by that time, the biggest news, I think, is to get on the sea, uh, to see where the ship, uh, where the airplane is. So I argued very fiercely to that commander of the Eastern Coast, um, but of course, failed. And uh, I got called the, uh, the headquarters of MAEA at KL. I said blah, 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 yesterday, whatever. But anyway, no matter how fierce you uh, fight there, um, you can understand they were not success. You are not allowed you to be on the boat. But then I did one thing. I think, okay, you cannot allow me to own the ship, but I, at least I can do something to let you know how I'm serious, how I mean to, to report covering the story. So next minute, I just go to uh, the nearby fisherman's village and I rent, I rent with the 400 ringgit for a boat, a fisherman's boat. And uh, of course, uh, this boat cannot carry me very far away uh, to this, that site, but at least uh, I can ask uh, this uh, boat to uh, catch up with uh, the, the MMEA ship by the coast there. Um, I, I can take, I, and I'm doing the video report there on the boat. And uh, um, it's interesting, they have a, I have a local media friend who was a photographer. Uh, he was not going to uh, get allowed it to own this uh, MAE ship, so he come along with me, <laughs> and he could take a camera there, and uh, uh, he got to the seasick, and he asked me, don't you feel the seasick? Uh, I say, oh no, I don't feel the same. But when you are on that uh, very, uh, your astronaut was uh, flushed in your blood, you have no time to feel the seasick. And uh, I just asked this fisher, fisherman's boat and uh, to try to catch up with that boat um, by the first, uh, I don't know, the first 30 minutes. And I got my stories out. And the most important, I think I got to say, 
this is my persistence, why I'm here. I need to do this report. And then uh, one thing after another, finally, it's got me to this uh, military radar information. That's an excellent personal story. And with that, we're going to open up questions to the audience. I'm sure many of you want to know more. Any questions out there from anybody? Of course, Paul. I mean, um, could you speak into the mic? <laughs> Touche. <laughs> So during the news coverage, you know, of course, some network had really made a ratings run over this. And so I guess my question is, you know, what is the person feeling that? Is that warranted? You know, did some people really overdo it and some people just didn't do enough? Good question. David? <laughs> okay. um, I, I think that I, I would sort of reframe the question a little bit to say that um, did they do enough that was right and accurate. I mean, I think that different, uh, different media organizations have different constituencies and, and different levels of news junkie, and uh, uh, they can make perfectly legitimate decisions about the level of coverage. What I do think is that <coughs> in, um, there were cases where we saw coverage that, that went a little bit beyond the facts because people had space or time to fill up. And I, I think that that's where the, um, the danger lies. And, and I certainly don't think, I think everybody uh, falls into this trap. I know we struggle with that at the AP, but, uh, but I think that rather than how much coverage there was, how much good and accurate and, and reliable coverage there was. I'd, I'd quickly just put it this way. I think that when something like this happens and it's a breaking news story, um, networks, uh, you know, because they have to fill up airtime, tend to create a logo and create a really catchy name for it, and then they have to fill an entire program with it. And when this turned out to not be the air crash that we thought it was, it turned out to be something far different, you still have to fill up that airtime. So it's a lot easier for newspapers and news agencies. We, we go with the news as it happens. Um, yes, if you have a newspaper, you have to put something on the page, but just generally speaking, I think that you know, if you decide to build a program around a news story, you're gonna get yourself into trouble. Well, was there any sensational reporting from the Chinese media? Um, I think I answered this gentleman's question in, uh, in this way. Uh, for the MH370's report, it's, uh, okay, I have to call to the Malaysian government, you already said, it's a very unprecedented. <laughs> and uh, actually, for myself, you could say in one, this one reporting of the event, I have experienced almost uh, every ba aspect of the journalism could be about everything. So as uh, uh, Ted has said, you verify, verify, and verify. But when every new clue is coming out, you want to follow it. That's what's what you reporters are called. And the, if there is overdo it or not do enough of it, OK. Everybody can, could take your own angle and try to learn your own step from it. We have a question from here, and then we go to Sharon. Sir, okay, with the microphone to this gentleman. I just want to ask, uh, did you, as big established media, just especially AP, WSJ, did you face like uh, pressures to match uh, like exclusives? Because in the, in the first few days, uh, different media had, you know, they were speaking to anonymous sources, U.S. officials or Inmarsat or Malaysian officials, unnamed sources saying different things. One saying you know, exploded, and some one of the media said it was an exclusive, and then very f it, it unraveled very quickly, right? You know, after one or two days, there was some evidence that said no, it, it didn't explode. So, uh, just talk about, you know, what kind of pressure you faced, you know, trying to match your competitors and how that affected your coverage. Yes, constantly, and it's still happening now. Um, I think, you know, the, the reporters who are on this story long term get those notes every single day. And what we do is on a case-by-case -case basis just decide, is this something we should try to go back and verify, ignore it, um, or, it, you know, it is something that we do have to match with, with our own verification or source or pick it up from the, from the AP. Um, it, it's just three months after it's happening, after this event happened, we're still doing it and we're still feeling the pressure. 
There's, first of all, there's always an implied pressure that we put on ourselves every time one of these things comes up because we think, oh my gosh, we have to get that, we have to find it, and we have to, to dig it out immediately. But I will say that one, one of my favorite things about the AP is that there's never been pressure to go with something that is unverified or that is, you know, uh, unreliable or is, that, it, that is thinly sourced, nothing like that. And I, I, it's one of the reasons I stay with the AP. It's one of the reasons I love the AP. I do think that... Um, when you have a story of this magnitude and of this level of attention that you have through no intent, you know, bureaus and offices of the AP all over the world sending you stuff and saying, you know, sending this FYI. And so you tend to feel like you're, you're uh, un under this giant thunderstorm of, of tips and, and FYIs and recommendations coming down. That's different from pressure to go with something that's unreliable, but it is a pressure nonetheless because you know that all these things are out there and all these people are are digging into one specific aspect of it. And as the AP, we want to make sure that we're on top of, of everything. So certainly, we feel that kind of pressure. How about Wong, the Chinese media? There's still a lot of competition and pressure to go and produce stuff that you yeah. cannot confirm? Yeah, I know the question is asked for the Watch Journal and AP. And uh, I also want to make up one thing. Let's say an example. Uh, besides the uh, military uh, radar information, another uh, remarkable thing uh, Tencent this time has done is the Imarsart, this complaints uh, reporting. On the first, on the night of the Malaysian government allowances, uh, the plane was uh, ended up in Indian Ocean. And they say it's according to the calculations by Imarsart. And on that very night, we got our articles out about how this Imarsart company is and how it's doing business. And especially, we got the phone call interview with Imarsart's uh, uh, high rank officials back in Britain. And it's, uh, of course, the fartest uh, in Chinese media. But by how? We don't have these uh, kinds of established resources as you guys. And, uh, but still, you have your things to do by the basic judgment of how these things were going on. They, I can say we focus, we have a latest uh, Imarsart a week earlier before that night, before the whole world get aware of it. By how? By on um, the uh, press conference in Malaysia. It's uh, on that conference I asked a very specific question about the pins, the last time pins, how did the government got it? They say, they mentioned about Imarsart, this company. And <laughs> by that moment, the, uh, the Mars uh, CEO answered the question to me. I don't think I even hear him enough because the Malaysia, I'm not a native English speaker, and uh, Malaysian is also not English speaker, so <laughs> I feel it's uh, difficult to get the language. But after that, I even to ask uh, the other people to translate to, to me. And I got, oh, Imarsart, this company, it got the data of how so it's, it, it is the last contact with the plane. It must be important. It must be critical. So since, since then, we got to try to contact with the Marsart. And that's why we got out our bills out the quickest. So even if you are not very long, again, not established, you have your place spaces to go. That's good news. And question only one question, one question left. Because we're running out of time, it goes to Sharon. So sorry about that. Well, out. guys, thanks for being here. This has been a really fun session to hear the backstory. Um, I guess I'll just say we've, we've talked all about news. I had an opinion. I felt like this topic was a real challenge because I was getting a lot of op eds that were just speculating on where the plane went. And, you know, Asia is important to us at the Seattle Times, aerospace is important to us. I'm wondering if any of you guys read any really distinctive opinion writing on this issue. I, um, I'm not going to be able to cite a source because I don't remember where it came from, but I do remember about the second week in an op-ed that I read that was trying to explore why we were paying attention to this and why we were so consumed with it. And it, uh, it, it didn't come to any particular conclusion, but it sort of uh, it, it looked into the notion of why something that's missing is so such an object of focus. And I thought that was a really good angle, and it's actually something that um, we tried to tackle as a news angle as well, but I think it actually it, it, it worked better as an op-ed. It was digging into the psychology of when something as tangible and as big and as solid and physical as a plane just vanishes into thin air, why that 
reaches inside some of us and makes us feel like we're off kilter. So that, to me, was a, was a really interesting way to come at it. And I don't remember the gentleman's name, but uh, he wrote a column for The Atlantic. Uh, he was into aviation, and he basically walked through the whole science and math of how everyone was wrong about where we were looking for the plane. And sure enough, you know, we're looking for the plane in a completely different place now. And, you know, it, it's, it, it took an independent voice to say that. And I think that that was good because it shook us out of our, our own preconceived notions and following what the officials say. And well, how about in the Chinese media? Any editorials or opinions that s stands out? Editorial opinion stands out. Um, I think it's um, um, it's uh, could be various angles, but if it's a one remarkable thing I can remember uh, record is um, um, for for this uh, uh, this stuff when it's coming from you have got the family members you got from the uh, Malaysia government uh, and it's very sensitive uh, it could be impact impacted to the both the bilateral relationships especially with the anniversary of the Malaysia and China's uh, relationship coming up so um, it's um, there is when you are focused on this uh, very accurate uh, detailed specific uh, flight incident there are large background there. It's complicated political or other stuff involved. So when you are doing this report, uh, there are the considerations uh, to keep the balance there. Okay, well, anyway, with that, we uh, have to thank each of our panelists, uh, Ted, Adam, and Juan, for giving us your insights into this very complicated story. And I, I want to wish you all thank them with a the clap. Thank you. And thank you to Alan Chung for moderating this panel. Thank you so much.